Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Payroll and Reward Brunch for April. Um, so let's get going with this. And you think, oh, the new tax year has started. There can't be much to, to say, but I, I can just find uh, something to say out of, out of nothing, to be quite honest. It's a real small board of things that I want to talk about and make you aware of. So briefly touch on finishing the last tax year. Then, because we've got the time, I want to look at the announcements in the spring statement in a little bit more detail. We're in 22-23 now, so there's some hints and tips about that. Then I want to look forward to the next tax year, not look forward as in looking forward, look forward as in looking ahead. Then we've got the Queen's speech coming up in a couple of weeks time. So maybe looking at some things that might be in there that affect the payroll and reward profession. And then I just want to update the profession quickly on the review that we're currently undertaking of the payroll administrator apprenticeship. So that's level three. And I've just had some information through from the Institute for Apprenticeships and Technical Education yesterday about the work that the Trailblazer and I have been doing. So I just want to make you aware of that. OK, so it's not over until it's totally finished and it's not totally finished until we've done a number of things. And the first one is the P60. I'm sure you're aware and some have even issued the P60 already. So there's a, a legal obligation to issue the P60, P60 by the 31st of May, so that'd be the 31st of May 2022, where someone was employed on the 5th of April, so the last day of the previous tax year, and there was a liability to operate tax in that tax year, which means that if somebody left on the 4th of April, they would have been given a P45, there's no legal obligation for you to produce one because they weren't employed on the 5th of April. If they were employed on the 5th of April, but they weren't paid, so maybe they started on the 1st, but weren't paid until the 25th, there's also no legal obligation for you to do it. However, I think you should perhaps be aware that if somebody left on the 4th of April, they maybe won't get a P60 at their new employment, maybe you'd want to provide a P60 to them. Um, and the same with somebody that uh, uh, started on the 1st of April, so they were employed on the 5th, but they weren't yet paid. They probably wouldn't get a P45 at their previous employment. So maybe you'd want to give them a P45 at this employment, just to show that they were employed on the 5th of April. Obviously, there's going to be no earnings, or there won't be any earnings. So it would just be blank earnings, and maybe earnings from uh, a previous employment, if you've got the P45. So I just wanted to point that out. P11D, okay, that's another obligation, 6th of July. And I'm gonna mention this a few times, payrolling benefits. It's too late to payroll benefits now for the tax year that we're in, 22-23. But I wonder if employers should consider payrolling for the next tax year. And it's going to take a while for an employer to change all of their practices and processes to, uh, to payroll benefits. But maybe given that we've got nearly, nearly a year, maybe employers would want to consider payrolling for next tax year. And then, of course, if you've got a P11D, you're going to have a P11DB and you've got to pay the Class 1A national insurance by the 19th of July. And I've put some a, a link down there to the payment reference number, which is made up of 17 characters. So that's the link on HMRC's website. And the 17 character payment reference number that you need to quote with your Class 1A payment is essentially your account office reference number, which is 13 characters. You put a 22 on the end to indicate that it's for tax year 21-22. And then you put an indicator of 13 on there to, to tell HMRC that the payment that you're making is for this account's uh, 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 reference number for the tax year 21-22, and the 13 will indicate that it's the 13th remittance in the tax year, therefore it must be class 1A. 
carrying on with uh, uh, things to consider about ending last tax year if you've employed veterans. Now, the veterans tax relief, the VAST, the veterans upper secondary threshold, was effective from April 2021, but not through the payroll until April 2022. So if you employed any veterans in the last tax year, so that's from April 2021, and you weren't able to get the relief through the payroll, maybe see that link and the way to get the relief, so um, on earnings up to the veterans upper secondary threshold, is either through your software, do a month 13 FPS, if your software allows it, or simply write a letter to HMRC saying, I want to claim tax relief, uh, national insurance relief, I beg your pardon, for the veterans that I employed in the previous tax year. And then just a reminder about gender pay gap reporting, hopefully in your organised and employer obligation, but, but because it concerns pay, obviously payroll are going to be um, uh, asked for information. In the public sector, you've got your snapshot date of the 31st of March, um, and in the private sector, most public sector, not all public sector, most public sector is the 31st of March. The uh, other public sector, your private and your voluntary, the snapshot date is the 5th of April, so the last day of the tax year. And in both of those cases, your gender pay gap reports have to be reported 365 days later or 364 days later. And there's just a rem quick reminder of the five reports that have got to be compiled by the employer containing 14 different pieces of information. Your quartiles report, your mean and your median um, uh, pay gap reports, and then all of the uh, percentage gap reports that you've got to uh, uh, produce. So four pieces of information for the quartiles, obviously, and then two for each of the others. And there's a link to uh, gov.uk gu guidance on how to make the uh, gender pay gap calculations. As I say, it's an employer responsibility. However, where else is the employer going to get the information from apart from payroll? So be aware of that. And then that should be the end of your 2021-22 obligations. And I'm going to talk about payrolling again. Um, simply because if you look at the employer bulletin, either from February or April, they keep talking about the P11D process being a legacy process. And whenever they talk about something being a legacy process, that means that it's, it's something in the past. It's voluntary that you payroll benefits at the moment. But anything that's voluntary is surely going to become mandatory, especially as HMRC have started to use this word, and they've been using it for a little while now, legacy. So do consider, have you got any benefits on your payroll which are relatively easy? Um, so rather than complete a P11D at the end of the year, you can stick the cash value, the cash, cash equivalent, through the payroll on a monthly basis. An easy one possibly would be your medical benefit or your dental benefit, which is reported on the, the P11D. As long as you know the annual value, you simply get the annual value for the employee and divide it by 12 and put that through the payroll on a monthly basis as a notional item. So all you're doing is collecting the tax on it. You're not paying it to the employee. You're just collecting it, uh, collecting the tax. So do have a look at those two bulletins, especially the April one, which says about uh, have you uh, have you considered payroll and benefits? The deadline, um, if you want to payroll benefits for 23-24, is 10 o'clock on the 5th of April 2023. And just some other things that hopefully you've considered. Have you ticked the box on the EPS to get your employment allowance? Have you considered the allocation of the apprenticeship levy, because you the, the, the allocation in this tax year doesn't have to be the same as the allocation last tax year. Have you ticked in your software that you're entitled to small employers relief? Have you done your basic earnings assessments for the, the childcare vouchers? And have you reviewed the national insurance for your directors, even if they are paid via the alternative method, so they're paid a regular amount every month and you collect national insurance as if they were a normal employee, you've still got an obligation at the end of the year to do an annual reconciliation of that national insurance. 
And one thing that I have mentioned before, but I think it's worth having it as a separate bullet point coming up, coming up differently, is if you as an organization are putting on your EPS a value, a value above zero of CIS deductions suffered, you need to quote with the value of CIS deductions suffered, the corporation tax unique taxpayer reference number, the CTUTR new data item details in the agent update from March 2022. So um, just consider those things. And now I want to look back at the, the spring statement, uh, seeing as maybe we've got a little bit of it, a bit more information. The apprenticeship levy, the spring statement said, we're going to look at the apprenticeship levy and how it works, whether or not it's actually working for the intention that it was um, set up for when it was originally set up. And I thought, what are, what are they actually going to do with this apprenticeship levy? Are they going to do away with it? Well, there's no um, sign at all that they're going to do away with the apprenticeship levy, but maybe they will extend um, the, the apprenticeship levy, what the employer can use the apprenticeship levy for, to maybe lower level qualifications. So that's maybe your T level qualifications and your higher level qualifications. There's no indication that it's going to be extended to pay for commercial qualifications or um, uh, commercial off the shelf training uh, from, from, from a training provider. So there's no indication of that at all. But I think it will be extended to lower level qualifications, statutory government recognized qualifications and these higher level qualifications as well. So we need to look out for that because an announcement is going to be made at the budget in the autumn. The employment allowance, yes, it's increased to, to £5,000. Have, are you aware of that? Has your software been updated to allow for it going from £4,000 to £5,000? Basic rate of income tax, up to 19%, absolutely great, from April 2024, which means that it applies from the 24-25 tax year. Now, the cynic in me immediately says, well, uh, the Conservative Party, perhaps the top right, tied themselves to this, whatever is going to happen in the next two years, they've tied themselves to this now, so let's hope that things get, get better. And all so I think, when's the next general election going to be? Um, the um, Oliver Dowden, the Conservative Party chairman, recently said that uh, the, the party is going on a two-year uh, general, general election campaign starting in May 2022, which means that the next general election is probably the first Thursday in May 2024, one month after the basic rate of tax is cut from 20% to 19%, uh, to but it won't be cut for Scottish taxpayers because Scotland can do whatever they like. And is it a guarantee that it's going to be cut for Welsh taxpayers as well? Because Wales can do what they like with regards to the um, uh, rates of income tax. Okay, they follow uh, the rest of the UK, so there's your English and your Northern Irish taxpayers, but they can adjust the rates of tax using the West Welsh rates of income tax. And just a note there for anyone's, uh, 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 if it's relevant to anybody, about gift aid, that relief will stay at the current basic rate of tax until April 2027. And this will be interesting when it's announced before the start of 2024-25, re reviewing all of the current tax reliefs that are available. And a review of tax reliefs generally means that they're going to get rid of some. I don't think they will add any more. They're probably going to get rid of some. That's me. I don't, I, I don't know. That's just me speculating. OK, the big announcement in the spring statement was the increase to the primary threshold from the current value to 12,570 for paydays on and after the 6th of July 2022, which means that the director's threshold is 13 weeks of the 
threshold and 39 weeks of the new primary threshold. So you can either operate it like that. So for every director's payday up until the 6th of July, you use the primary threshold of 9880, and then afterwards you use 12570, or you can just apply the whole annual threshold of 11,908 from the start of the tax year. So we've got primary thresholds that apply for paydays from the 6th of April to the 5th of July, and they're on the screen there. And then we've got another set of primary thresholds which apply from paydays from the 6th of July. And it's only the primary threshold that has changed. The lower earnings limit doesn't change the point at which the employer starts paying national insurance, which is the secondary threshold. That doesn't change. The fust doesn't change and nor does the upper earnings limit. In fact, the upper earnings limit get used to those figures because they're not going to change for a few years at the moment. Uh, although whatever's in legislation can change, but at the moment they're, they're, they're going to be frozen until 2026. Now, these national insurance increases were also confirmed in the budget and specifically the 1.25 percentage point increase. So if you're on national insurance category letter A, you won't pay national insurance at 12%, you'll pay at 13.25%. The employer won't pay at 138 they'll pay at 15.05. So that was confirmed that the increase is going ahead. And I don't really think there was any doubt that the, the, the government was going to backtrack on that. The UK government was going to backtrack on that. It confirmed the primary threshold for 13 weeks is a, a lower value. And then for the rest of the tax year, it's at the higher value, which is going to mean that an employee is national insurance. It's not going to affect an employer, but an employee's national insurance will go up in the first 13 weeks of the tax year, and then it will significantly go down because the point at which the employee starts paying national insurance has significantly risen. Which brings me back to this um, pay slip message which HMRC have requested employers still put on the pay slip even after the increase to the primary threshold they're still saying that they would like employers to put this on there well if an employee sees their national insurance going up dramatically and then going down to a level perhaps that it wasn't at in the previous tax year, so they're paying national insurance at a lower level than they were paying in 2021-22. Is it even worth and is it appropriate and relevant to put on a payslip a 1.25% uplift in NICS funds the National Health Service and the health and social care? And I just think employers really need to consider whether or not that is going to achieve the intention of reducing queries to the payroll department. Um, yes, you've got this, and I'm aware that this issue has been, been raised by, by, by somebody who came to me. Um, how is your software going to deal with the fact that the annual earnings threshold or the primary threshold has changed for 13 weeks? It's one value. For the rest of the tax year, it's a higher value, or it could just be the one uh, aggregated value for the whole of the tax year. How is your software going to deal with it? Has your software dealt with it correctly? I have made, since I received this query, I have made a number of um, inquiries with a, a, a couple of colleagues and I said, have you checked your directors in your software? Is your software dealing with it uh, well? And luckily they, they were saying, yes, absolutely fine. We've checked all of our directors. We check them anyway. Um, we check them and yes, the, the, the threshold is working OK, but I would advise you to check your software because I am aware that at least one piece of software is maybe not doing it correctly. So we're in the new tax year. What do we need to consider for the new tax year? And I think the big thing about 2022-23 and how we should, whether we should communicate um, is about the freezes to a number of thresholds, student loan thresholds, plan two and postgraduate loans. They've been frozen at 2021-22 levels. I'll come back to those. 
the auto enrollment thresholds have also been frozen. And I'll come back to those as well. Personal allowance hasn't gone up. We would have expected it to have gone up, but that's been frozen until April 2026. And if that's been frozen, it means the marriage allowance has been frozen as well. Basic rate limit has been frozen, as has the higher rate threshold for rest of the UK taxpayers, not Scottish taxpayers, for rest of the UK taxpayers, including Welsh taxpayers. And of course, the upper earnings limit is aligned to the point at which someone will start to pay tax at the higher rate. Um, that's been frozen as, as well then at 50,270 for the next five years as we stand. Lifetime allowance, that's been frozen for the next five years, as, has, as have all of the pension allowances. So do we communicate that? I think it's much better to communicate that information to employees because that's actually fact and you can you could you, you can say well the reason that you 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 haven't significantly paid less tax is because your personal allowance has been frozen the marriage allowance has been frozen the basic rate limit has been frozen an employee will understand that there's nothing you can do about it it's in legislation it's what the uk government decide um, They'll understand that communication, I think, much better than a payslip message which says about a 1.25% uplift in national insurance when they look at their payslip and say, well, I'm actually paying less national insurance than I did last year, or where's that 1.25% come from, my opinion. With regards to national insurance, then, We've got to look at two new thresholds in the payroll for 2022-23. I've mentioned the VUST before, which gives us national insurance category letter V. And then we've got the FUST, which is the free ports upper secondary threshold. So that's for employees working for employers that are based in free port tax sites. So you've got four national insurance category letters there. F is your standard, ISL is your reduced rate, uh, and, and deferred. But it's what the FUST has done is it's changed the way that we calculate national insurance manually and it's changed the way software has to calculate national insurance. And I have mentioned this before, but again, it's worth, worth repeating. The earning thresholds that we declare on the FPS, they are unchanged. So we report the, we're reporting the earnings up to the, including the LEL, the LEL to the primary threshold, primary threshold to the upper earnings limit. We still do that as we've always done it, but it's the calculation of contributions that have changed. So we have to uh, break the earnings down into five or six bands now, including this FUST. And for each of that band of earnings, we apply the relevant percentage and multiply it up. And sometimes we, uh, we perform a rounding calculation as well. And it's that rounding calculation and it's the FUST itself that causes this change to national insurance calculation. And a, a colleague of mine last year uh, and I were, were talking about it about it and said, well, actual fact, there's three ways to calculate national insurance for the current tax year. You've got the table method, where you've always had the table method, which is always going to differ from the exact percentage method. You've got the exact percentage method that uh, some software developers might be using because of guidance it, uh, written by HMRC and issued to them in the EB5, which includes this FUST. So you've got some software that will do it that way. You've got other software that will do it as per the legislation, which then the legislation says that the first threshold, the free, free port upper secondary threshold only applies to employees that are on national insurance category letters F, I, S and L. So it doesn't apply if you're a national insurance category letter A and B and all that kind of thing. So you don't have to do this revised way of uh, national insurance calculation. And the reason that I say that, it's a real pain in the backside. Some software developers will do it as per HMRC's non-statutory guidance. Other software developers will do it as per the legislation. And I would, I, I, I can 
sympathize with the software developers that are doing it as per the legislation, because that's the way that I would do it if I was a software uh, software developer. But if you're doing a manual calculation, so you're looking at an employee's national insurance and you're wanting to manually calculate it just to check that your software is doing it right, I think you need to approach your software developer and you need to, to say, well, how are you calculating national insurance if they're doing it via the exact percentage method? Are you doing it as per software developer guidance, the EB5, or are you doing it as per the legislation? Okay, moving on. We've talked about this before. The COVID statutory, uh, the coronavirus statutory sick pay rebate scheme closed on the 17th of March, and the portal closed as well with the um, expiry of the Coronavirus um, Act 2020. So, if you had any claims to make or amend any claims, they should have been made by midnight on the 24th of March. If you've still got any claims to make, the portal is actually closed and you won't be able to make those claims. With regards to COVID um, SSP, you've got a different situation depending on where you are in the United Kingdom. Kingdom. You've got a situation in Northern Ireland and you've got a situation in Great Britain with regard the waiting days. Now, waiting days in the Coronavirus Act 2020 were suspended by, by, by other regulations. Uh, if, if the uh, period of incapacity for work was COVID related, um, that fell away on the 24th of March, but Northern Ireland decided to keep that suspension of waiting days power as they are perfectly entitled to, because statutory sick pay is actually devolved to, to Northern Ireland. So three waiting days suspension continues to apply in Northern Ireland for COVID uh, uh, related SSP and in Northern Ireland COVID related SSP can be paid if someone's self-isolating as a result of guidance or they feel that they need to self-isolate to protect other people or for medical reasons but that does not apply in Great Britain. You had another piece of legislation that saved uh, the, the waiting day suspension that applied before they fell away um, on the uh, 25th of March. But in Great Britain for COVID SSP, somebody will still have to serve those three waiting days. Doesn't apply that way in Northern Ireland. And carrying on with SSP, and I have mentioned this before, but it's a reality now that from the 6th of April, 2022, if there is capacity or capability at the general practitioners or the, the medical practitioners, they can issue a digital fit note. And simply a digital fit, fit note means that there's no requirement for the medical practitioner to actually put anything on the fit note in ink. So if you get one of these in and there's no ink and there's no signature, well, that's perfectly OK because digital fit notes are allowed. And it's still valid for state sickness support and state sickness paid by the employer, which is statutory sick pay. Interesting uh, uh, question came out this week in, um, in the House of Commons, actually, about the advisory electricity rate, which was, has applied from the 1st of September, and it's currently eight, uh, five pence per mile. And a Labour member of Parliament said to the Chancellor of the Exchequer, have you looked at, uh, given, the, given uh, a, a lot of people are using electricity, uh, electric cars now, have you looked at raising this five pence per mile? And the response was really interesting, uh, which said, which is absolutely true, it's just an advisory rate. It's like the advisory fuel rates. The advisory electricity rate is just an advice. But employers don't have to use that. They can use whatever rate they like, provi providing they can justify that rate. So you can use whatever reimbursement rate you like, as long as you can justify it. And the payment that goes to the employee for reimbursement of mileage in an electric vehicle doesn't result in a profit. 
any element of the reimbursement that results in a profit is taxable on the employee and subject to national insurance as well. So I thought that was quite interesting. That came out this week in the House of Commons uh, question. So just some hints and tips for this tax year. Don't forget that CIS deduction suffered if that applies to you. Hopefully, if you've got a value of CIS deduction suffered and you put it on the EPS, but you don't have the corporation tax, uh, uh, unique, uh, yeah, corporation tax unique taxpayer reference number, your software will reject the, um, the EPS anyway before it gets rejected at HMRC. So hopefully that would happen before it gets rejected. And then the 648, that changed for new clients from the 31st of March. So if you've got a new client after, on or after the 31st of March, you need to use the new form 648. And the real difference with the new form is that it will allow an employer or a client to actually say, well, I want this agent to look after this particular tax corporation tax, P-A-Y-E, income tax, corporation tax, something like that. That's the real difference with the, with the change, if it applies. Oh, what else are we talking about? Oh, national, this is interesting, actually. National minimum wage, national living wage um, increases, increase substantially um, for paydays on or after uh, the 1st of April, where that was the, the, you know, the start of the first pay reference period, I think it came out very well. That is regarded as a pay increase for the purposes of statutory maternity pay. If there is a pay increase and there were significant increases in the national minimum wage, so if there was a pay increase uh, as a result of somebody being on the national minimum wage for statutory maternity pay, what you've got to do is you've got to, re if that, if that uh, increase applied in any time between the start of the relevant period up to, an, the, up to the end of the maternity leave period, what you've got to do is you've got to recalculate the average weekly earnings. Have a look at the employer bulletin, February 22, and I was really pleased to see it in the employer bulletin um, in, in February, which said, because we should always have been doing this, we should always have been recognising that a, a national living wage, national minimum wage increase was a pay increase. Uh, but they made it clear for the very first time, have a look at the employer bulletin where it says it, and also have a look at the statutory payments manual. Um, and I can't remember the page. I can't remember the page. Um, and, and it says on there, um, if someone gets a, a, a pay increase between the start of the relevant period up to the end of the maternity leave period, you've got to recalculate the average weekly earnings. That doesn't apply with other child-related payments, so that's your statutory adoption pay, your statutory paternity pay, your statutory shared. For those, you're only looking at whether or not the pay increase occurred in the relevant period, and the relevant period is that eight-week period um, uh, with adoption. It's the eight weeks prior to the 15th week before the child is matched with the adoptive parents. That's guidance is in the statutory payments manual as well. And I've given a link to that. And the reason that I've put Alabaster next to the statutory maternity pay and Gillespie next to the other child uh, related is that be because it that Alabaster and Gillespie refers to the case law ruling. And I'm sure, I hope that people will be familiar with Alabaster and the recalculation of statutory maternity pay, specifically the specifically the average weekly earnings, may be not so familiar with Gillespie, because Gillespie came along before Alabaster, but Gillespie still applies to adoption, paternity, shared, doesn't apply to statutory maternity pay. And, oh, the flipping payslip message. I do think we should consider it. I do think that it might be increasingly inappropriate to, uh, to, uh, to put a message that your national insurance has been uplifted, but don't worry, it's going to pay for their national health. Don't worry, it's going to pay for your health and social care as you get older. When somebody looks at their pay slip and, and says, well, I don't pay national insurance anyway, or, oh, my national insurance has gone down. What are they on about? 
us own the payroll department. Most importantly, it's not mandatory. There's nothing in legislation that says you must put this payslip message on. Hopefully that's the last time I have to talk about the payslip message because I've been on about it for months. Um, okay, I mentioned this earlier on, and that's the freezing of the Plan 2 and postgraduate loan thresholds. Now, the Plan 2 student loan and the postgraduate loan student loan only apply to English and Welsh borrowers. Doesn't apply in Northern Ireland. In Northern Ireland, it's all rolled into Plan 1, and in um, Scotland, it's all rolled into Plan 4. Uh, now. So Plan 2 and Postgraduate only apply to English and Welsh borrowers. They've been frozen and the in initial problem was with, with that was, well, legislation says that they will be inflated every year. Well, we need to get away from that because if legislation says it, it it's easy enough to overwrite legislation and say we're not going to do it. Uh, and that's happened more than once recently. At the time, the Department for Education and the Department for Education is an English authority. You've got the Department for Education in Wales, but it was the Department for Education in England that announced the freeze, which the Department for Education in Wales had to follow because they've got limited scope to, 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 to diverge at the moment. At the time, they said, we're going to set out our further plans for, for what we're going to do with the plan two and postgraduate loans, particularly the plan two. And they're referring to this AUGA review. And that applies, the AUGA review, Philip AUGA, I think it was, Philip AUGA, um, have a look um, at the review because it says, and what will be implemented is that for students that um, uh, take out a student loan for the academic year starting September 2023, the repayment period will be extended and the repayment threshold will be lowered simply because Philip Auger said in his review that the taxpayer should be meeting less of an employee's student loan. The, the ex-student that's now an employee should be repaying as much money as they possibly can. And the way to do that is to extend the, the, the period of time for which, they, for which they're repaying their loan and to ensure that they can earn less money before they start to repay their loan. So I looked at the response from Wales um, who weren't happy with it at all. Um, and I, I wrote to my member of parliament, um, obviously I, I, I live in Wales, I wrote to my member of the Senate as well. And I said, if Wales actually don't, if Wales are not happy being dragged along with a review that applies to English borrowers. And if, so if Wales aren't happy, there's no good bleating about Wales being unhappy and putting out a statement. They need to do something proactive. And maybe rather than being dragged along, they need to set up a Welsh only student loan, which will have a different threshold because there'll have to be an English student only loan for the students uh, uh, from the academic year, September 2023 and onwards when the repayment period is extended and the repayment threshold is lowered and they're already talking about a plan five, not in payroll this year, probably not in payroll because the earliest that would be payable is 2024, isn't it? So we're not looking, we're not, we're, we're not looking imminently, but this is what I said to Wales. If you're not happy with it, do something about it. Otherwise you're going to be dragged along with England's plans. Auto enrolment thresholds. This is interesting as well. I wonder what's going to happen here. We've got the earnings figure frozen at ten thousand pounds, but it's been frozen since somebody will remember. Um, uh, it's been frozen um, ever since ten thousand pounds ceased to be the value of the personal allowance. So it's been a number of years. The lower and the upper qualifying earnings band have been frozen, which means that the link, fundamentally, the link with the national insurance lower earnings limit an upper earnings limit has been broken. Coincidentally, the upper qualifying earnings band still remains the same as the value of the upper earnings limit, but we need to get away in our minds, the link with the national insurance, LEL and UEL has been broken. 
So of course, the impact of that is you're going to get more people um, uh, being bought into saving, which is a good thing for the government. There's more people saving for their retirement and perhaps less dependent on a state pension. But we need to consider this review of auto enrollment called maintaining the momentum. And uh, the, the maintaining the momentum review from 2017 was all about, well, listen, we've, we've been going for five years because auto enrollment started in 2012, been going for five years. It's going really well. How can we maintain this momentum and get more people saving get more people saving more money. And two ways that we can do that by the mid 2020s is removing that lower qualifying earnings band altogether. Bearing in mind that a lot of pension schemes will start to take contributions at the lower qualifying earnings band up to and including the upper. So they take contribution on back contributions on band earnings. That's what that kind of scheme is. So if you remove it altogether, somebody in a banned earnings state scheme would pay from pound one, the worker, but the employer would as well. And uh, auto enrollment only applies when someone's between 22 and state pension age. But if we did away with 22 and brought it down to 18, more people being auto enrolled and auto re-enrolled, and they're paying more money. Really good thing. Mid 2020s. Now, what is meant by the mid 2020s? Bear in mind we're 2022 now. It's not far away. So it's interesting to see a statement from the pensions minister in February who said about this mid 2020s in the fullness of time, we'll do it. Well, the fullness of time is, doesn't equal the mid 2020s. And then you've got the Department of Work and Pensions who said a month later, yes, we're committed to doing it, subject to an engagement with stakeholders, because we recognise that it's going to make things less affordable for both the worker and the employer. Now, engagement means consultation. Again, the cynic in me says, why, if, if we've got a general election, possibly in May 2024, which is roughly the mid 2020s, do we actually want to go into a general election or does the UK government want people to go into a general election having just had their first pay step, maybe they're paying less tax, but they'll pay more pension contributions or does mid 2020s mean 2025, a year after the general election? I don't know, one to watch out for. So uh, looking forward then to the tax year 2023-24, we've got to look at the impacts of the NICS increases in two regards, the employment allowance eligibility, because if your NICS go over £100,000, you, you're ineligible for the employment allowance, Well, national insurance has increased significantly for both employer and employee, definitely for the first 13 uh, weeks for the employee. Well, if your NICS increased to £100,000, you're ineligible to claim this £5,000 employment allowance and your small employers can get 103% back of their statutory and maternity pay, adoption pay, paternity pay, but they won't be able to get that back if their NICS increase to over £45,000. So I think throughout this tax year, we ought to be looking at um, uh, uh, whether or not we're eligible for employment allowance, we're eligible for small employers relief and consider that the increase in NICS might take us out of eligibility criteria for the next tax year. And then, of course, as NICS goes down in the following tax year, maybe we'll be brought back into eligibility in 24-25. Oh, my word. Queen's speech coming up. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll go through this quite quickly because we've got two weeks to go uh, to the state opening of parliament. And the state opening of parliament is all to do with the UK government's policies and their legislative programme for the coming 12 months. So that, that parliamentary session. I think 
that probably it's the last opportunity that the UK government, bearing in mind we've got the Scottish government, you've got the Northern Ireland executive, and you've got the Welsh government, so they'll carry on legislation. But for the UK government, it's probably the last major season for legislating before a general election. I, I, I think it probably is. <clears throat> So what will then the Queen's speech include? Well, it's going to include things that have been carried over from the current parliamentary session, um, and it's been voted that they carry over, because otherwise when the par current parliamentary session ends, um, they just fall away. So there's been four bills, I think, that have been carried over, not payroll related, uh, that have been carried over into the next parliamentary se session. Any bills that were announced at the previous Queen's speech, but were not actually introduced, they will for, go into the next parliamentary uh, session. And also bills which have been foreshadowed, and that's the, the, the terminology that the House of Commons use, and foreshadowed really means where a government minister has said, we're gonna do something about this, and we've written a paper about this, and there's a policy about this, that's what foreshadowed, there's something that's happened previously, which indicates that a bill will manifest itself at some time. And that's what Her Majesty uh, will say on the 10th of May probably for payroll related, and it's all up in the air because we don't know the contents of it, there's going to be something about this lifelong learning loan, which can be uh, taken out. That's a big one, extending the national minimum wage to carry, uh, for, uh, to, to extend uh, properly to workers of, uh, in, in ferries or on ferries. And then this employment bill. Well, Her Majesty talked about the employment bill in the Queen's speech just after the general election in 2019, which, and it's mysteriously, never manifested itself. Now, the, the um, uh, Employment Bill will um, set into legislation a lot of the things that were mentioned in the Good Work Plan. You remember Matthew Taylor's Good Work Plan. I looked at the Good Work Plan and it said about UK workers this and the UK needs to do that and uh, uh, do this in the UK. We have to bear in mind that employment law is devolved to Northern Ireland. So I think that anything that's in the employment bill will only relate to Great Britain because Northern Ireland can do what they like. So we're looking at probably extending shared parental leave possibly to grandparents, that's been rumbling away for ages, carers leave, neonatal leave and pay, and this goes back to Theresa May's uh, 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 premiership when she talked about enhanced maternity protections. So look out for that employment bill, and I wonder if it will specifically say this applies in Great Britain. And I wonder what they're gonna do about pensions tax relief. Will that be in the Queen's speech? That is something that's been rumbling away for many, many years. You know, the, 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 the relief of source and the net, it's just wrong, it's just not fair. Will they do something with pensions tax relief? Bearing in mind, this is the last probable time that the UK government would get to do anything unpopular before a general election. And quickly, regarding the Level 3 apprenticeship, I want to update you. I'm the Trailblazer Chair, so I'm working with a great team of um, employers on the Trailblazer. And the Payroll Administrator Apprenticeship applies in England, or at least where 50% of the employee's time is spent in England. 2018, it was done. 2021, 22, we're doing a review because things have changed in the payroll environment since uh, 2018, when it was first put together. Two parts to the payroll administrator apprenticeship is the standard and there's the endpoint assessment plan. Now with regards to the standard, what the trailblazer and I have been doing is putting together a, a, a profile of the occupation. Um, in, in, in the payroll administrator role, uh, someone will normally do this and this and report to, to, to this person. With regard to the duties, well, in this role, the payroll administrator will typically do this, 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 this and this. So the trailblazer have put all of that together, went to the Institute for Apprenticeships. 
and then progression routes as well. So what the Institute are very keen now is that all new standards or revised standards don't just leave it at, um, well, you've done this, now you've got this professional vocational qualification, but say, well, now you've done this, consider you could go here, you could go there, you could go there. There are ways that you can progress from the level three apprenticeship. But the key part of the occupational standard is the definition of the knowledges, skills, and behaviors. Now, the knowledges, skills, and behaviors in 2022 are different from the, the knowledges, skills, and behaviors that applied to the current payroll administrator apprenticeship. Not fundamentally different, but things have changed. Um, in payroll. For example, you've got the health and social care levy next year, 2020-23. That needs to be written in. It's not written into the uh, 2018 one. So they've slightly changed the knowledge, skills and behaviours. And then we've got the endpoint assessment to do after the standard. And we've got to look at the endpoint assessment methods. And currently there are three methods, the multiple choice questions, the role simulation and the professional discussion. What I've been looking at with the, the trailblazer, we've put together all of the details in the occupational standard, including the KSBs, the knowledge, skills and behaviors. The Institute for Apprenticeships and Technical Education came back to me yesterday with a draft and they said we've we, we, we've gone through sort of like uh, various algorithms and we've looked at wording and all that kind of thing and we've come back with these comments so I need to look at that this afternoon with regards to the endpoint assessment plan it's almost definite that the endpoint assessment methods will change to be aligned with the endpoint assess assessment methods that exist in the level five apprenticeship, which are the multiple choice questions. And rather than a role simulation, there's going to be a project, a work base, a workplace project, rather than a fictional role simulation, there'll be a project completed at the workplace. And again, the professional discussion. But it all hinges around these KSBs. And that's the thing that I need to get right. And so it's just an update. And then I was only advised yesterday, and I will advise the profession as we go through. But we're really making good progress um, on revising that. And oh, one of the last things I want to do is just to tell you about two upcoming I Realize webinars that are payroll related, which you might find interesting. The first one on the 14th of June, um, it's, it's looking at your payroll function and from our experience, looking at the 10 areas where it actually, it actually could be falling down and what you could be doing to improve the payroll function. And another one, implementation lens successfully as well so that those those details and the links will be on your slides when they come out but I want to um, finish and, and allow time for any questions and I hopefully and I've rambled on for nearly an hour um, you'll have all of these slides Rick um, let me have a glass of water <coughs> Yeah, good morning. Sorry, there was a there's a typo on that first. It's actually the 14th of May. So uh, we'll send out the links for both of those webinars. I did that. That's um, why I that's why I <laughs> yes. yeah, I spotted that. All right, six minutes. We've got a couple of quick questions. Um, first off, you say about payroll and benefits, however, isn't that a major change for businesses, especially those that rely on the production of P11Ds as a revenue stream? Well, yeah, I agree. If you're going to put something through the payroll on a monthly basis rather than put an annual value, do it once a year. I agree. You're going to have to change your processes. You're going to have to educate your, your, your staff. Absolutely. Um, but it doesn't mean that the P11D specialism, expense and benefits specialism that we have is actually taken away. That specialism generally is applied only between the end of the tax year up to and including the 6th of July. What this specialism now requires, if you're payrolling benefits and putting it through on a monthly basis, is that specialism is applied on a monthly basis. And the, the reason I'm, I mean, I'm, I, I, I wouldn't say I'm an advocate. No, I do advocate it. Yeah, I do advocate it in actual fact. I, I, I do. I think it's the way to go. But I think it's the way to go. And I think employers need to change their mindsets, need to change their processes, need to change their practices, because eventually anything that's voluntary 
will become mandatory. So before it becomes mandatory, let's get in uh, ahead of the game. But I can see what employers are saying. Yes, it's a big revenue stream. And I've had that with employers. It's a big revenue stream. You shouldn't be advocating it. We make our money out of doing P11Ds. But it doesn't mean that that revenue stream is lost. It's just going to be appropriated or a portion throughout the year. That's my view. Okay. Uh, moving on quickly, in light of the cost of living crisis, um, do you think that there will be an emergency budget like the Labour Party is calling for? Well, they did call for that. And Rishi Sunak, uh, I think he did an interview with, oh gosh, somebody or other. And he said it was a silly idea. Uh, to do that because we don't know what's going to happen uh, specifically with the the, the, the price crack cat price the price cat review uh, that's due to be effective the first of October. I don't think I don't think there'll be an emergency budget because the government are already pointing to these where well, you, you can have a loan. Is it a £200 loan, £200 loan that you've got to repay back over a number of years? There's £150 off your council tax, slightly different in Wales. Um, uh, we, we're putting this support, we're putting this support. I don't believe that there'll be an emergency budget. I, I don't believe there will be. I think he's waiting to see how bad it's going to get. OK, um, three minutes to go and there's three more questions. Um, Natalie asks, do we need to consult employees about payrolling benefits? seeing as they will see the impact on their tax? Well, I think it's absolutely. When I did this at an organisation, I would say it took me a good year to actually win over employees. So I went to, to my employees and I said, well, um, uh, once a year, I give you a P11D with your medical benefit on it. Uh, benefit on it. What I'm going to do now is rather than put it on there once a year, I'm going to put it on your pay slip so you see it every month. So your pay tax every month. And there were queries from employees. Will I pay tax twice? All of that kind of thing. So I had to explain. I had to explain to them. I had to engage with employees. I had to get their buy-in, first of all. Then I had to engage with my software developer and say, I want to do this. Can you facilitate it? Then I had to do more workshops with employees. So absolutely, I think it's a really good thing to engage with employees. Absolutely. OK. When do you believe that the auto-enrolment changes will take place? Before or after general election? After. That's easy. Are there any new national insurance letters for veterans for pay deferred national insurance? No. Now with fight with the the, the fast the free port. There's F I S and L F standard I def, uh, reduced S deferred and L maybe I'm in the wrong order. But there's there, there's four. But with veterans, no, there isn't. A, a reduced one and there isn't a deferred one it's just v so if you've got somebody uh, that, that pays national insurance at the reduced rate um you would have to if it's affected the national insurance you would have to write to hmrc at the end of the year but with veterans there's just v with free ports there's faisal f-i-s-n-l okay looks like we've done is it good mm -hmm. hey, i've answered everything have i you have, yes. Terrific. Oh, it's not bad. I'm nearly bang on the hour. <laughs> All right. Well, I will send around uh, the recordings, the slides, and the correct dates and links uh, later on today, hopefully. Terrific. All right. Thank you. Thanks, okay. everybody.